ago as 1860, it was the proper thing to be born at home. At present, so I'm told, the high gods of medicine have decreed that the first cries of the young shall be uttered upon the anesthetic air of a hospital, preferably a fashionable one. So young Mr. and Mrs. Roger Button were fifty years ahead of style when they decided one day in the summer of 1860 that their first baby should be born in a hospital. Whether this anachronism had any bearing upon the astonishing history I am about to set down will never be known. I shall tell you what occurred and let you judge for yourself. The Roger Buttons held an enviable position, both social and financial, in antebellum Baltimore. They were related to the this family and the that family which, as every Southerner knew, entitled them to membership in that enormous peerage which largely populated the Confederacy. This was their first experience with the charming old custom of having babies. Mr. Button was naturally nervous. He hoped that it would be a boy so that he could be sent to Yale College in Connecticut, at which institution Mr. Button himself had been known for four years by the somewhat obvious nickname of Cuff. On the September morning consecrated to the enormous event, he arose nervously at six o'clock, dressed himself, adjusted an impeccable stock, and hurried forth through the streets of Baltimore to the hospital, to determine whether the darkness of the night had borne in new life upon its bosom. When he was approximately a hundred yards from the Maryland Private Hospital for Ladies and Gentlemen, he saw Dr. Keene, the family physician, descending the front steps, rubbing his hands together with a washing movement, as all doctors are required to do by the unwritten ethics of their profession. Mr. Roger Button, the president of Roger Button & Company, Wholesale Hardware, began to run toward Dr. Keene with much less dignity than was expected from a southern gentleman of that picturesque period. Dr. Keene, he called, Oh, Dr. Keene! The doctor heard him, faced around, and stood waiting, a curious expression settling on his harsh, medicinal face as Mr. Button drew near. What happened? demanded Mr. Button, as he came up in a gasping rush. What is it? How is she? A boy? Who is it? What? Talk sense, said Dr. Keene sharply. He appeared somewhat irritated. Is a child born, begged Mr. Button. Dr. Keene frowned. Why, yes, I suppose so, after a fashion. Again he threw a curious glance at Mr. Button. Is my wife all right? Yes. Is it a boy or a girl? Hear now, cried Dr. Keene, in a perfect passion of irritation. I'll ask you to go and see for yourself. Outrageous! He snapped the last word out in almost one syllable. Then he turned away muttering. Do you imagine a case like this? will help my professional reputation. One more would ruin me, ruin anybody. What's the matter, demanded Mr. Button appalled. Triplets? No, not triplets, answered the doctor cuttingly. What's more, you can go and see for yourself, and get another doctor. I brought you into the world, young man, and I've been physician to your family for forty years, but I'm through with you. I don't want to see you or any of your relatives ever again. Goodbye. Then he turned sharply, and without another word, climbed into his phaeton, which was waiting at the curbside, and drove severely away. Mr. Button stood there upon the sidewalk, stupefied and trembling from head to foot. What horrible mishap has occurred? He had suddenly lost all desire to go into the Maryland Private Hospital for ladies and gentlemen. It was with the greatest difficulty that a moment later he forced himself to mount the steps and enter the front door. A nurse was sitting behind a desk in the opaque gloom of the hall. Swallowing his shame, Mr. Button approached her. Good morning, she remarked, looking at him pleasantly. Good morning. I, I'm Mr. Button. At this, a look of utter terror spread itself over the girl's face. She rose to her feet and seemed about to fly from the hall, restraining herself 
only with the most apparent difficulty. I want to see my child, said Mr. Button. The nurse gave a little scream. Oh, of course, she cried hysterically. Upstairs, right upstairs, go up. She pointed the direction, and Mr. Button, bathed in cool perspiration, turned falteringly and began to mount to the second floor. In the upper hall, he addressed another nurse who approached him, basin in hand. I'm Mr. Button, he managed to articulate. I want to see my... Clank! The basin clattered to the floor and rolled in the direction of the stairs. Clank! Clank! It began a methodical descent, as if sharing in the general terror which this gentleman provoked. I want to see my child, Mr. Button almost shrieked. He was on the verge of collapse. Clank! The basin reached the first floor. The nurse regained control of herself and threw Mr. Button a look of hearty contempt. All right, Mr. Button, she agreed in a hushed voice. Very well. But if you knew what a state it's put us all in this morning, it's perfectly outrageous. The hospital will never have a ghost of a reputation after... Hurry, he cried hoarsely. I can't stand this. Come this way, then, Mr. Button. He dragged himself after her. At the end of a long hall, they reached a room from which proceeded a variety of howls. Indeed, a room which, in later parlance, would have been known as the crying room. They entered. Well, gasped Mr. Button, which is mine? There, said the nurse. Mr. Button's eyes followed her pointing finger, and this is what he saw. Wrapped in a voluminous white blanket, and partly crammed into one of the cribs, there sat an old man, apparently about seventy years of age. His sparse hair was almost white, and from his chin dripped a long smoke-colored beard, which waved absurdly back and forth, fanned by the breeze coming in at the window. He looked up at Mr. Button with dim, faded eyes, in which lurked a puzzled question. Am I mad, thundered Mr. Button, his terror resolving into rage. Is this some ghastly hospital joke? It doesn't seem like a joke to us, replied the nurse severely, and I don't know whether you're mad or not, but that is most certainly your child. The cool perspiration redoubled on Mr. Button's forehead. He closed his eyes, and then, opening them, looked again. There was no mistake. He was gazing at a man of three score and ten, a baby of three score and ten, a baby whose feet hung over the sides of the crib in which he was reposing. The old man looked placidly from one to the other for a moment, and then suddenly spoke in a cracked and ancient voice. Are you my father, he demanded. Mr. Button and the nurse shook violently. Because if you are, went on the old man querulously. I wish you'd get me out of this place, or, at least, get them to put a comfortable rocker in here. Where in God's name did you come from? Who are you? burst out Mr. Button frantically. I can't tell you exactly who I am, replied the old man, because I've only been born a few hours. But my last name is certainly Button. You lie. You're an imposter. The old man turned wearily to the nurse. Nice way to welcome a newborn child, he complained in a weak voice. Tell him he's wrong, why don't you? You're wrong, Mr. Button, said the nurse severely. This is your child, and you'll have to make the best of it. We're going to have to ask you to take him home with you as soon as possible, sometime today. Home, repeated Mr. Button incredulously. Yes, you can't leave him here. We really can't, you know. I'm glad of it, whined the old man. This is a fine place to keep a youngster of quiet taste. With all this yelling and howling, I haven't been able to get a wink of sleep. I asked for something to eat. Here his voice rose to a shrill note of protest, and they brought me a bottle of milk. Mr. Button sank down upon a chair near his son and concealed his face in his hands. My heavens, he murmured in an ecstasy of horror. What will people say? What must I do? 
You'll have to take him home, insisted the nurse, immediately. A grotesque picture formed itself with a dreadful clarity before the eyes of the tortured man. A picture of himself walking through the crowded streets of the city with this appalling apparition stalking by his side. I can't, I can't, he moaned. People will stop to speak to him, and what was he going to say? He would have to introduce this, this septuagerian. This is my son, born early this morning. And then the old man would gather his blanket around him, and they would plod on, past the bustling stores, the slave market. For a dark moment, Mr. Button wished passionately that his son was black. Past the luxurious homes of the residential district, past the home for the aged. Come, pull yourself together, commanded the nurse. See here, the old man announced suddenly. If you think I'm going to walk home in this blanket, you're entirely mistaken. Babies always have blankets. With a malicious crackle, the old man held up a small white swaddling garment. Look, he quavered. This is what they have ready for me. Babies always wear those, said the nurse primly. Well, said the old man, this baby's not going to wear anything in about two minutes. This blanket itches. They might at least have given me a sheet. Keep it on, keep it on, said Mr. Button hurriedly. He turned to the nurse. What'll I do? Go downtown and buy your son some clothes. Mr. Button's son's voice followed him down into the hall. And a cane, father. I want to have a cane. Mr. Button banged the outer door savagely. Chapter 2 Good morning, said Mr. Button nervously to the clerk in the Chesapeake Dry Goods Company. I want to buy some clothes for my child. How old is your child, sir? About six hours, answered Mr. Button, without due consideration. Baby supply department in the rear. Why, I don't think... I'm not sure that's what I want. It's... He's an unusually large-sized child. Exceptionally, uh, large. They have the largest child sizes. Where is the boys' department, inquired Mr. Button, shifting his ground desperately. He felt that the clerk must have surely sensed his shameful secret. Right here. Well, he hesitated. The notion of dressing his son in men's clothes was repugnant to him. If, say, he could only find a very large boy suit, he might cut off that long and awful beard, dye the white hair brown, and thus managed to conceal the worst, and to retain something of his own self-respect, not to mention his position in Baltimore society. But a frantic inspection of the boys' department revealed no suits to fit the newborn button. He blamed the store, of course. In such cases, it is a thing to blame the store. How old did you say that boy of yours was? demanded the clerk curiously. He's sixteen. Oh, I beg your pardon. I thought you said six hours. You'll find the use department in the next aisle. Mr. Button turned miserably away. Then he stopped, brightened, and pointed his finger toward a dress dummy in the window display. There, he exclaimed, I'll take that suit, out there on the dummy. The clerk stared. Why, he protested, that's not a child's suit. At least it is, but it's for fancy dress. You could wear it yourself. Wrap it up, insisted his customer nervously. That's what I want. The astonished clerk obeyed. Back at the hospital, Mr. Button entered the nursery and almost threw the package at his son. Here's your clothes, he snapped out. The old man untied the package and viewed the contents with a quizzical eye. They look sort of funny to me, he complained. I don't want to be made a monkey of. You've made a monkey of me, retorted Mr. Button furiously. Never you mind how funny you look. Put them on, or I'll, or I'll spank you. He swallowed uneasily at the penultimate word, feeling nevertheless that it was the proper thing to say. All right, father. This with a grotesque simulation of filial respect. You've lived longer. You know best. Just as you say. As before, the sound of the word father 
caused Mr. Button to shudder violently. And hurry! I'm hurrying, Father. When his son was dressed, Mr. Button regarded him with depression. The costume consisted of dotted socks, pink pants, and a belted blouse with a wide white collar. Over the blouse waved the long whitish beard, drooping almost to the waist. The effect was not good. Wait! Mr. Button seized a pair of hospital shears, and with three quick snaps, amputated a large section of the beard. But even with this improvement, the ensemble fell far short of perfection. The remaining brush of scraggly hair, the watery eyes, the ancient teeth, seemed oddly out of tone with the gaiety of the costume. Mr. Button, however, was obdurate. He held out his hand. Come along, he said sternly. His son took the hand trustingly. What are you going to call me, Dad? He quavered as they walked from the nursery. Just baby for a while? Till you think of a better name. Mr. Button grunted. I don't know, he answered harshly. I think we'll call you Methuselah. Chapter 3 Even after the new addition to the Button family had had his hair cut short, and then dyed to a sparse, unnatural black, had had his face shaved so close that it glistened, and had been attired in small boy clothes made to order by a flabbergasted tailor. It was impossible for Button to ignore the fact that his son was a poor excuse for a first family baby. Despite his age stoop, Benjamin Button, for it was by this name they called him, instead of by the appropriate but invidious Methuselah, was five feet eight inches tall. His clothes did not conceal this, nor did the clipping and dyeing of his eyebrows disguise the fact that the eyes under were faded and watery and tired. In fact, the baby nurse, who had been engaged in advance, left the house after one look, in a state of considerable indignation. Mr. Button persisted in his unwavering purpose. Benjamin was a baby, and a baby he should remain. At first, he declared that if Benjamin didn't like warm milk, he could go without food altogether. But he was finally prevailed upon to allow his son bread and butter, and even oatmeal, by way of a compromise. One day he brought home a rattle, and giving it to Benjamin, insisted in no uncertain terms that he should play with it, whereupon the old man took it with a weary expression, and could be heard jingling it obediently at intervals throughout the day. There can be no doubt, though, that the rattle bored him, and that he found other and more soothing amusements when he was left alone. For instance, Mr. Button discovered one day that during the preceding week he had smoked more cigars than ever before, a phenomenon which was explained a few days later when entering the nursery unexpectedly he found the room full of faint blue haze, and Benjamin, with a guilty expression on his face, trying to conceal the butt of a dark Havana. This, of course, called for a severe spanking. But Mr. Button found that he could not bring himself to administer it. He merely warned his son that cigars would stunt his growth. Nevertheless, he persisted in his attitude. He brought home lead soldiers. He brought toy trains, he brought large pleasant animals made of cotton, and to perfect the illusion which he was creating, for himself at least, he passionately demanded of the clerk in the toy store whether the paint would come off the pink duck if the baby put it in his mouth. But despite all his...